Hello everyone, today we're going to implement a dynamic circular queue using an array. So let's get started. Now before we get to what is a queue, if you enjoy this content, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and most importantly click that notification bell for updates. Now I definitely recommend that you check out my video on how to implement a linear queue using an array, as it'll give you a better understanding of why we're implementing a circular queue using an array in the first place. So what is a queue? A queue is simply a linear data structure that supports FIFO operations. And linear means that you can add items and remove items sequentially from the queue. And FIFO stands for first in, first out. And all that means is that the first item that you add to the queue is the first item that you remove from the queue. Similarly, the last item that you add to the queue is going to be the last item that you remove from the queue. Now, let's look at the enqueue method. Now, as we've seen with the linear queue, the problem that we faced was that we either used it too much space or we used it too much time. And to combat this, we're going to use the idea of wrapping elements back around as if they were in a circle, thereby reducing our space consumption that we've seen with a linear queue. So just like a linear queue, my front and rear are going to be set to negative 1 to represent that I have no elements currently in my queue. At the point where I add my very first element to my queue, I'm going to set both my front and rear to index 0, since my front element and my rear element are going to be the same exact element. Now with a circular queue, we cannot just increment our rear by a single index, like we've seen with a linear queue. And the reason for this is because picture our rear was at index 5, and we want to insert another element. Then using the idea of rear plus 1 would give us an index of 6, which does not exist in our array. So we have to find another way to combat this. And if we think about this carefully, our 5 plus 1 is going to give us a value of 6, and the remainder from 6 divided by 6 is going to be 0, which is the next index in the array. So we can effectively use this idea or this calculation of rear plus 1 modulo length to give us the next index in the array. Now, this clearly works with any other index in the array as well, because as we know, every index is going to be less than the length of the array. So that means when that index is divided by 6, we're going to get that index as a remainder. Now let's take a look at some NQ operations. If you want to NQ an element, our next position is going to be 1 modulo 6, or at index 1. Then our next position is going to be 2 modulo 6, or index 2. And our next position is going to be 3 modulo 6, or index 3. And so on and so forth. Now at the point where our index is 5, since we're enqueuing in a clockwise direction, at the point where our rear plus 1 is going to equal to our front index, then we know we have a full queue. So now let's look at the DQ method. So as we've seen with our NQ method, to get the next index, all we do is take that current index, add 1, and then modulo the length of the array. And that same concept or that same calculation clearly applies to the front variable. All we're doing is using another variable. So to set our front to the next index in the queue, all we do is take our front plus 1 and then modulo length. So we'll get 1 modulo 6, which is going to give us a value or index of 1. And we do the same thing to get the index of 2, and the same thing to get the index of 3. Now let's look at some more NQ operations to show you that circular process. So here our rear is at the last index in the array. And as we know, to get the next index, all we do is take our 5 plus 1 and then divide it by 6 and use that remainder. So that's going to be 6 divided by 6, which gives us a remainder of 0. So our next index is going to be 0. And the same process applies for every single index. Now as we've seen before, at the point where our rear plus 1 modulo length gives us the front index, then we know we've filled our entire array and we have no more space. Now let's look at the common operations associated with Q. Here I'm going to cover 6 common operations. NQ, GQ, peak, is empty, is full, and resize. Now my is full and resize methods are going to be helper methods. Now before we get to those methods, let's see what the actual class structure of a circular queue looks like. So if you've seen my video on how to implement a linear queue using an array, you may notice that this is the exact same class structure as my linear queue. And that's because it is. The only things that change are going to be the way that we enqueue and dequeue. So here we have three instance variables front, rear, and a nums reference variable. Our front is going to keep track of the front of our queue, and the rear is going to keep track of the rear of our queue. Our nums are going to be an interray that's going to represent our queue. In our constructor, we're going to take in an initial size, which is going to be used to represent the initial size of our queue before we resize. We're also going to initialize our front and rear to negative 1 since our queue is empty. 
Now let's look at the NQ method. So in our NQ method, we're going to take an argument's data and use that data to add to our queue. So the first thing you want to do is check if our queue is full, because if our queue is full, then we have to resize our queue. However, in this case, our queue is not full. So we simply move on to our else if. So now we want to check if our queue is empty, because as we know, an empty queue would mean that our front and rear are both set to negative 1. So we'd have to increment both our front and rear to represent that we've added our first element to our queue. However, in this case, our queue is not empty. So we'll simply perform that same calculation like we did in the illustration. We'll set our rear equal to rear plus 1 modulo nums.length, which is going to give us the index of 1. At that point, we simply insert our data at that position. Now, let's look at the DQ method. So in our DQ method, the first thing that we want to do is check if our queue is empty. Because if our queue is empty, then that means that there are no elements to remove. In that case, we'll simply throw a new no such element exception. However, in this case, our queue is not empty. So the next thing we want to do is to be able to store the data at our front index in order to return it. Then, we want to make sure to check if our front is equal to our rear. Because if our front is equal to our rear, then that would mean that we have exactly one element in our queue, and then we can set both our front and rear back to negative 1. However, in this case, our front is not equal to our rear, so we move on to our else. Now, as we've seen before, to get the next element in the queue, we're going to have to set our front equal to front plus 1 modulo nums.length, again that same calculation. So we've set our front to index 4, and then we simply return our data at index 3. Now, let's look at the peak method. So our peak method is very simple. The first thing we want to do is check if our queue is empty, because if our queue is empty, then we can simply throw a new no such element exception to indicate that there are no elements currently in my queue. However, in this case, our queue is not empty, so we'll simply return the data associated with the front index in our queue. So now, let's look at the empty method. Our empty method is just as simple. So all we have to do is check if our front is equal to negative 1, or even our rear is equal to negative 1. Because as we know, if our queue is empty, both our front and rear will be set to negative 1. However, in this case, my front is not equal to negative 1, so I'll simply return false. Now our isful method is just as simple. Because as we've seen with the animation, if my next index is equal to the front index, then that means that I have a full queue. So in that case, if my rear plus 1 modulo my numbers out length is equal to my front index, then I'll simply return true. However, in this case, I'll simply return false. Now, let's look at the resize method. So there's a bit more code here, but as we go through it, you'll see how simple it is. So the first thing I want to do is double the size of my queue if my queue is full. So I'll simply create a new array object of size nums.length multiplied by 2. Now, because I'm copying all the elements from my old queue to my new queue, I'm going to need a variable to keep track of where I am in my new queue, as well as a variable to keep track of where I am in my old queue. So I'll use my variable i here to traverse my new queue. And I'll set j equal to front that will be used to traverse my old queue. I'm going to set it to the front of my queue, because that's where my queue begins. Now, as you see with most circular structures, it's a really, really good idea to approach this using a do while loop, because my front is my starting condition, and my front is also going to be my stopping condition. So this gives me the power to first explore my front, increment my index, and check if I've reached back at my front index. Now, inside my do while loop, I'm going to copy the elements from my old queue into my new queue, and I'm going to increment my i every time I do so, to get to the next empty position in my new queue. Now, the reason my j is not incrementing by a single index, like j is equal to j plus 1, is because, remember, my old queue is a circular structure, and in order for me to get the next element, I'm going to have to take that current index, add 1, and mod the nums.length. So that's what I do here to get to, the, to my next index. Then I set my front to 0, since the front of my new array, or my new queue, is going to be at index 0. Now, since my old queue is full, then I know that the number of elements in my old queue is going to be equal to nums.length. So as I can simply set my rear equal to nums.length minus 1 to represent the index of the last element in my new queue. Then lastly, I simply have my nums reference variable refer to my new array object temporary. If you enjoyed this content, please hit that like and subscribe button. See you in the next video.